Hello guys, uh, welcome to this video. Uh, in this video, we will go through unit two of this particular learning journey, which is building side-by-side -side extensions on SAP BTP. So in the previous videos, we have completed unit one and we also completed the uh, quiz for unit one. Now we will move on to unit number two, which is setting up the CAP project. So let's go to uh, module one, first module of unit two, which is, talks about introducing the OData protocol. So what is OData protocol? Okay, open data protocol. This is the full form of OData. OData means open data protocol. It is an OSS standard that defines the best practice for building and consuming RESTful APIs. So this is a very important term, RESTful APIs. OData is used to build and consume RESTful APIs. OData helps you to focus on your business logic while building RESTful APIs without having to worry about the approaches to define request and response headers, status code, HTTP methods, and there are a lot of other things. So it basically helps you build your RESTful APIs and focus on your business logic. So it is an open standard. This OData, it is an open standard, which is defined by the OSS consortium. Now, OData also guides you in tracking changes, defining functions or actions for reusable procedures, sending asynchronous or batch requests and so on. Additionally, OData provides a facility for extension to fulfill any custom needs for your RESTful APIs. So here, OData RESTful APIs are easy to consume. This is one bullet point here. And the OData metadata, every OData service has a metadata. So what is metadata of the OData service? It is a machine readable description of the data model of the APIs. So whatever is the data model defined for the API, all that description will be defined in the uh, metadata document of the OData service. So it enables the creation of powerful generic client proxies and tools. Now we'll go through the basics, OData basics. One of the main features of OData is that it uses the existing HTTP verbs, get, put, post, and delete against addressable resources identified in the URI. So addressable resources means, so say for example, an OData service is basically, it will expose uh, some backend functionality, okay? Now a resource is, say for example, an OData service is, uh, is exposing a list of products from the backend. So your product or list of products is called resource. Also, it is an addressable resource. The product is an addressable resource and which is identified in the URI. URI is Uniform Resource Identifier. So in an OData service, you will, you can access this addressable resources which are exposed in the service and you can use these existing http verbs get put post and delete against those resources so conceptually odata is a way of performing database style create read update and delete operations on resources by the http verbs right so odata is a way of performing database style so you can create a resource you can read a resource you can update the resource or you can delete the resource using the odata service so now these are the HTTP verbs okay, which are supported by the OData service for, uh, for, a, for each and every addressable resource which is exposed by the OData service. So get means you get the resource. This is an HTTP verb which means you get the resource. Okay, what is a resource? A collection of entities, a single entity or a structural property, etc. So you can get the list of products, say for example, or uh, a particular product, details of a particular product using the get operation of an OData service. Now post means you create a new service. So using the OData service, uh, say for example, for a product, you can create a product uh, using the OData service. Put means you update an existing resource by replacing it with a complete instance. So you can update uh, an existing product with a completely new instance. Patch means update an existing resource by replacing part of its properties. So that is patched. So that is the difference between put and patch. Patch means updating by replacing part of its properties with partial instance for a particular resource. Delete means remove the resource. So these are the HTTP operations which are supported by the OData service for whatever resource that OData service is exposing. 
Now, coming to the OData service, OData currently supports two formats for representing the resources it exposes. Now, say for example, our OData service is exposing a list of products. So it will expose the list of products uh, in a particular format. So either it can expose using the XML based atom pub format or it can expose using the JSON format. So this is how data will be represented in the OData service. Now, the JSON format, it has significantly less protocol overhead than the Atom publishing protocol. And this JSON format can be easily consumed by, with JavaScript and SAP UI5. So Java, JSON from format is what is generally used when you implement SAP UI5 applications. Now, each OData service is represented by a URI called the service root URI. URI means uniform resource identifier. So using this uh, uniform resource identifier, you can access each and every resource or each and every entity which is being exposed by the OData service. Now say for example, the uh, as, uh, as I mentioned that if the OData service is exposing a list of products, so the product you can access by using the URI. More precisely, each resource can be accessed using a URL, a uniform resource locator describing how to access the resource. This type of identification enables interaction with representations of the resource across network using specific protocols like OData. Now, types of documents associated with each OData service. There are two types of document associated with each OData service. So this is important. There are two types of documents associated with each OData service. One is the service document and one is the service metadata document. So service document, it lists entity sets, functions, and singletons that can be retrieved. Entity sets, again, whatever resources uh, the OData service is exposing. Clients can use it to navigate the model in a hypermedia driven fashion, and it is available at this URL. So this is the format of the URL uh, where the service document will be available for an OData service. Now coming to the service metadata document, this describes the types, sets, functions, and actions understood by the OData service. Metadata document is basically a description of the OData service. So it can be used to understand how to query and interact with the entities in the service. So how many entities are there in the service, uh, which means how many resources the service is exposing, and how do you have to query and interact with those uh, resources? It is mentioned or it can be determined or understood in the service metadata document, and it is available at uh, this particular format of the URL. Important thing is that at the end of this URL, dollar metadata. So this will give you the metadata document. And the UR, this URL will return XML metadata of the service. So the metadata is always returned in the XML format. Now, OData and CAP. Now, when you are creating a CAP application, a cloud application programming, application uh, services are usually articulated through core data service models so whenever you are creating a service uh, in your cap application uh, you will always create first you will always create the core data service models uh, for your core data service and these core data services are managed by cap runtime environment in the cap framework every functional component is viewed as a service these services represent the interactive characteristics of a domain, including the entities they expose, the actions they enable, and the events they trigger. So first of all, every each and every service is articulated through core data service models. So core data service models, as in you create, first of all, you create data models uh, for what data has to be exposed. And then on top of those CDS models, you create your CAP service, which is OData service to expose data from those CDS models. So this is a pictorial representation where say there is a database. So on the database, based on the data which is available in the database and what data you want to expose as part of your CAP application, you will create domain models, which is CDS models. So because a database will contain like extensive set of data, say for example, for product it has uh, a lot of uh, data available, but you don't want to expose all of it, right? So whatever you want to expose, you create domain models, CDS models based on that. And the, then these domain models are uh, exposed using the service and API models. So then on top of these domain models, 
uh, you create service and API models. And these service and API models are exposed uh, using OData services, right? So first is database layer. Then based on the database, you create your domain model. And then based on the domain model, whatever data you want to expose as part of your service, you create service or API model. And uh, based on the service and API model, you create your uh, service, all right? So you can say that domain model is a subset of the database. Service and API model, again, is a subset of your domain model. And on top of the service and API model, you implement or create your OData service and expose your data to the customer. Okay, so here is a note. While the default protocol for exposed services in CAP is OData, so this is the default protocol for exposing your data in CAP application, which is OData service. You can also make use of protocol adapters in CAP to override the default behavior. So that is a possibility. So you can use uh, some other REST protocol or you can create a GraphQL API to expose your data but uh, the default protocol is OData. So this is just an overview uh, unit or overview chapter about uh, OData services and what OData service mean in terms of a CAP application. Uh, now, if we see what is there, the summary, you now have a more profound understanding of the OData protocol and you can describe its key concept. You also learned about OData in CAP and have heard about the possibility to use a different protocols through protocol adapters. So that also we know. So th that is all for this particular module, which is introducing OData protocol. I think we can go to the next module also, which talks about explaining JSON and YAML. So explaining JSON and YAML, this is the second module of this particular uh, unit, setting up CAP project. So let us go through this, explaining JSON and YAML. So say there's a business scenario, uh, you, you have to create configuration files for various cloud native services. Okay, you have to create configuration files. So what will you use? Will you use a JSON file or will you use a YAML file? So we'll try to understand what these two formats are. So what are JSON and YAML? JSON overview, JSON is JavaScript object notation. It is an open standard format for data storage and exchange. So JSON is a data storage and data exchange format. Okay, it employs easy to read text to encapsulate data objects, which consist of key value pairs in arrays. So data is represented in a JSON format by using key value pairs and arrays frequently utilized for web applications to communicate with servers. This is uh, where a JSON format is frequently used when the web application has to communicate with servers. Now, though influenced by JavaScript syntax, JSON operates independently and enjoys support across various programming language. So JSON is not like specifically tied to JavaScript applications. So JSON is fundamentally built upon two key structures, a set of key value pairs. This is often implemented as an object in multiple programming language. So this is how data is represented in JSON format. Then it, a sequentially ordered series of values. Most languages interpret this as an array. So these are the two ways in which data is represented in a JSON uh, document. So key value pairs and ordered series of values. So here we can see, so this is key value pair, business key, business partner, value one. Again, first name and its value, last name and its value. Okay, then again, this is again, another key value address and then its value. So key value pairs, and this is an array. Uh, so list of, uh, ordered list of values, which is also called as array. So this is how the phone numbers are represented here. Now coming to the, the next type, which is YAML. So YAML is again, it's a human friendly cross language, Unicode based data serialization language designed around the common native data types of agile programming languages. So the important point here is that it is a data serialization language. YAML is a human friendly cross language, Unicode based data serialization language. 
It is broadly useful for programming needs ranging from configuration files to internet messaging to object persistence to data auditing. So these are the primary use cases for YAML uh, file like data represented in a YAML format. The primary use cases are if you have to uh, represent data in configuration files or uh, for internet messaging or object persistence to data auditing. This is where YAML is primarily used. So YAML was specifically created to work well with well for common use cases such as configuration files, log files, inter-process messaging, cross-language data sharing, object persistence, and debugging of complex data structures. So these are the primary use cases of YAML file. When data is easy to view and understand, programming becomes a similar, simpler task. YAML file names, these are the extensions used for a YAML file. So, okay, this is an overview of what a YAML file is and like what are the use cases for a YAML file. Now here, YAML is a strict JSON superset. So this is very important. Uh, YAML is a superset of JSON. So every JSON file is also a valid YAML file. Um, so, and YAML includes additional features as well, such as notion of tagging data types, support for non-hierarchical data structures, and option to structure the data with indentation. You can do indentation in a YAML file and multiple forms of scalar data coding. YAML is an open format. So YAML representation describing a business partner. This is an example. So this is how YAML file is represented. And this is how a JSON file is represented. So it basically you can say that the additional features which are provided by YAML on top of uh, like in addition to what JSON provides is that uh, notion of tagging data types, support for non-hierarchical data structure, option to structure data with indentation, multiple forms of scalar data coding. Now, YAML in relation to JSON, both JSON and YAML aim to be human readable data interchange formats. However, JSON and YAML have different priorities. So we'll see that what are the difference between JSON and YAML goal. JSON format, JSON's foremost design goal is simplicity and universality. YAML's foremost design goals are human readability and support for serializing arbitrary native data structures. <clears throat> so this is the difference in goal for JSON and YAML. Cost to generate, JSON is trivial to generate and parse and at the cost of reduced human readability. So it, you can see what it is trying to say here that it is uh, trivial to generate, but it is like it comes at the cost of reduced human readability. Compared to YAML, it allows for extremely readable files, but is more complex to generate. Cost to process, JSON uses a lowest common denominator information model, ensuring any JSON data can be easily processed by every modern programming environment. YAML ventures beyond the lowest common denominator data types requiring more complex processing. Okay, so this it can be easily processed. This requires complex processing. So these are the differences between YAML and JSON, uh, like as data representation, different formats. So YAML can therefore be viewed as a natural superset of JSON. This is a very important. The YAML can be viewed as a natural superset of JSON. Offering improved human readability, YAML provides more human readability and a more complete information model. This is also the case in practice. Every JSON file is also a valid YAML file. This makes it easy to migrate from JSON to YAML if or when the additional features are required. So here in this particular uh, unit or in this particular module, we understand about these two formats, data formats, JSON and YAML. Uh, what are their like definitions and how the data is represented in JSON format and in YAML format and what are their differences. I think that is it for this particular video. Now uh, in the next video we'll go through the next uh, unit or next module about discovering the end-to-end -end use case. So for now this is it uh, which I wanted to cover. Thank you for watching the video and uh, we'll see you in the next video.